Okay, now we consider a special type of LP space. It's called L2 space. So when P equals 2, uh, we have a lot of other structures of the space. And uh, most notably is the inner product. Okay, this is only for the case p equals to 2. Okay, so let's first define what is the uh, inner product. Suppose we have two functions in the L2 space. Okay, so this uh, this e is arbitrary, any measurable set. Uh, so we will just ignore this e uh, in this subsection. So it can be worked for we can work this out for any sub uh, measurable set measurable set e. Then the inner product. of f and g is defined by the integral of f times g over the set e. Or in other words, this is just integral fx, gx, dx. Okay. Um, again, you can see that uh, so we, by the way, we use the notation this to be to denote the uh, inner product. Uh, in LaTeX, this is, uh, is denoted by L angle or left angle, and right angle. Okay, so that's how we define inner or how the notation of inner product is used in the LaTeX. All right, so. Um, one thing that we can notice is that the inner product, when we take the inner product, it becomes a, becomes a number, right? It becomes a scalar. And this is equal to the value, uh, the integral of the product of f and g. And this is less than or equal to the integral of the absolute value. And uh, according to the uh, holder's inequality, this means that Hirsch Schwarz inequality is the less than or equal to the 2 norm of f times the 2 norm of g. Okay, uh, If f and g are both in R2, then this must be finite. Both of the terms are finite. So that means the inner product must be finite as well. All right, so now uh, we can easily check several facts about inner products. Uh, basically, inner products takes two R2 functions, and it will map, it to, map them to a scalar. And apparently, this inner product is pretty much like pr product is uh, symmetric. Right? You take any f, if the inner product of f and g is the same as the inner product of uh, g and f. And it's linear in both arguments. For, for example, the inner product of this f plus g, f1 plus f2 and g is equal to the inner product of f1g plus the inner product of f2g. And also, you can scale any of these two arguments. For example, you take the inner product of alpha g, alpha f and g is equal to alpha fg, and this is equal to f times alpha g. Just using the definition, right? If you have some alpha flowing around, then it doesn't matter if you put it outside or inside. Okay, so that's the inner product. Uh, for complex valid functions, uh, we, we actually need to modify a little bit. For example, when we have uh, complex valid functions in this alpha, when we put in here, then we need to put the, the conjugate. But things in this course, we want to consider uh, the real valid functions, so we will not have that complication. Uh, complication. But the the uh, general rules are pretty similar, almost identical. All right, so we are going to give a, a example. 
well, the example is actually something from uh, what we learned before. Suppose we know f and g are in L2, then we will know that 2 times the one norm of f and g is less than or equal to t times f norm squared small over t g norm squared for any t. Okay, uh, sometimes people you like to put this two uh, to the right side so you have t over 2 and 1 over 2t right here instead of having the 2 on the left. Uh, the proof is, is pretty straightforward. It's actually not that, it's just uh, using the fact that when you multiply two uh, numbers, you will just get, you can extract the root of t for f, and then also 1 over root t for g. And then this, by the Young's inequality, this becomes less than or equal to uh, t f squared over 2 plus 1 a uh, g norm a uh, g square over 2t right and then you take the integral on both sides then take integral on both sides and then implies the uh, inequality there okay Now let's consider several. Um, uh, let's consider one of the properties for uh, for the R two space. Suppose we have a sequence in the R two space such that uh, the sequence of functions f k in the R two space, and they con they convert to another function, meaning that this is going to zero, then we can show that the inner product of f, k, and g will converge to the inner product of f and g no matter what this g is, okay, or any g in L2. Okay. So the proof is um, we look at the, the, the difference of these two We want to show that this one goes to zero as k goes to the infinity, right? And apparently, you can see that this is just a, due to the linearity of inner products. We can combine the first arguments to get that, and then because of the uh, uh, the property we mentioned right here, this is going to be less than or equal to the two norm of f k minus f times the 2 norm of g. But we know that the g is in R2, so this number is finite, and this number is going to 0. So that's why this goes to 0 as k goes to infinity. And this proves that this is true. Okay. All right, so we'll uh, deal with this in uh, uh, real analysis 2, or the functional analysis. Uh, which uh, we will see lots of things like this. Uh, this is often called the weak convergence of fk, and this is often called the strong convergence. So the strong convergence implies the weak convergence. Okay. Give me, give me a new definition. So we say that f and g in R2 uh, they are called orthogonal if their inner product is zero. Okay, pretty much like in a vector space, when uh, we say two vectors are uh, orthogonal if the inner product of them is equal to zero. And also we say that a set of functions in R2 so this A is the index set so we just have a 
a family of functions and we call this family of functions orthogonal if you pick up any two of them uh, any two of them uh, in the set in the family the inner product is equal to zero or these two are orthogonal For any two different uh, functions in the family, they are in the, uh, the inner phi is equal to zero. Okay. Um, if you can also, uh, if the norm or if the two norm of the uh, the phi alphas or the functions in this family are all equal to one. then we call this orthonormal. Orthogonal and the normal vectors, the unit vectors, or ortho orthogonal and the unit functions. Right, so this is pretty similar to uh, to vector space, uh, and we are even borrowing the names from there. All right, so let's see example. A very typical example of such base of such kind of orthonormal uh, sets is this. Consider. Um, consider this space. L2 of negative pi to pi. So this is the all the L2 integrable functions over the interval negative pi to pi. And it has a uh, orthonormal basis. But such kind of functions, which you know, it's just a cosine sines. Okay, and uh, for all the case, uh, for all the integers k, a natural numbers k. Okay, and this is an orthonormal basis. And to check that, you just need to check. Yeah, if you pick up any two of these functions and uh, you take the inner product, you get zero. And you pick up any one of them, you check that our two norm is equal to one. Okay, then you check that this is an orthonormal basis. Okay. So I will not go to the details, just a basic calculus. Um, an important result here is that a, an orthonormal set is at most accountable. At most accountable. Okay, it could be it could be uh, finite. You just pick up a finite many of them. Right, you can form a finite uh, finite orthonormal set, but if you have orthonormal set, it cannot be uh, over countable. It has to be at the most countable set. Uh, the proof this requires uh, the result that we've learned from the last lecture, which says that um, the L2 space is separable, and actually all the LP space for P greater than or equal to one uh, is separable. And then we're going to use that fact here to prove this result. Okay, so the proof is like this. Um, it's actually very inspiring. Suppose we have a orthonormal set.
then uh, when we look at pick up any two of uh, these functions and check their norm, check the difference, uh, check the norm of the dif difference. So say phi alpha and phi beta. Let's check their norm, two norm, square. So apparently this can easily show that this is going to be equal to the phi alpha square minus two times phi alpha phi beta plus phi beta square. This is basically break the square. Uh, then you get into this. So pretty uh, straightforward to show. And then uh, because this is a orthonormal set, and that means the first term is one, right? Because the norm of each of these functions is equal to one. Second term is zero, uh, because uh, they're orthonormal. So inner product between any two different ones is equal to zero, and the last one is also one. So I just uh, we just know that this is equal to two. Okay, or in other words, the distance between any uh, the distance between any two functions in this family, or this is an orthonormal set, is uh, bigger, is, is uh, equal to square root of 2. Okay. All right. And this is interesting uh, in the sense that if we look at, uh, say, this point denotes the uh, one function, so phi alpha. And uh, another function, phi beta, has to be here. And the distance of them must be, must be equal to root 2. Okay? So this, they are kind of isolated from each other uh, since the distance is constant. It's not arbitrarily small. And with this, we can see that um, suppose... This gamma denotes the uh, countable dense set of L2. And we know such a gamma exists because the L2 space is separable. Right? So we know that this exists. And the property of a dense set is that for any function uh, in R2, you can find, and for any uh, epsilon you set, any positive number epsilon you set, you can find some function in this gamma, such that the distance of this function to uh, that function at the beginning of, uh, to the original function, or to the function in R2 you just specified at the beginning, the distance is less than epsilon. Right? That's how we said it's a dense set. Right? And this means that for each of these functions phi alpha, we can we're able to find say we set epsilon to be um, half of root two or even smaller, and then say we we'll let this, then for any alpha, there exists some function, say. Uh, Um, let's call it the gamma alpha in this uh, dense set such that the distance between phi alpha and the gamma alpha is less than uh, epsilon which is equal to root 2 over 2 and what this says is uh, you know the, the length here is, is root 2 so I cut it in half and then I draw this ball here. And know that within this ball, there's no other uh, functions from that orthonormal set because the distance between every two distinct uh, functions in that set is equal to root 2. Okay. So I know that within this ball, there is no other phi alpha or phi betas. Okay. On the other hand, I know that within this ball, I will be able to find this gamma alpha. All right, and apparently this gamma alpha is not going to be in any other balls centered at any other uh, phi alphas, right?
Okay, and this what this implies us implies is that if we can associate every phi alpha with some element in this gamma, then that means the uh, cardinality of this orthonormal set cannot be bigger than the cardinality of this gamma, right? Because for each of this, we can find someone that is uh, associated to that, and uh, you know, for each of other ones, there will be another gamma beta there. So for each one, we can find one associated one with them. So this means that the cardinality of A or the orthonormal set must be less than or equal to the cardinality of the gamma. But the gamma is a countable dense set. That means the cardinality of this is LF0. Okay, it's the um, it's a countable set. So that means the orthonormal set here must be countable as well, at most countable as well. Okay, and this implies that uh, a orthonormal set is at most countable. Okay. Now let's. Uh, um, so actually, this implies uh, this is this technique is uh, so also useful to prove uh, many other things. For example, uh, we mentioned that our p space is separable for p between one and the positive infinity. We know that this is separable, right? This is separable. But uh, you may ask, what if what happens to our infinity? Uh, the reason why we didn't include that is because our infinity is not separable. For example, uh, let's just look at a simple case: uh, our infinity of zero one. Um, you know, our infinity means our infinity space means that the uh, uh, the essential supremum is is a finite number, right? So let's consider a family of um, functions in our infinity. Say I have this kind of functions. I call them phi alpha, where alpha is between zero and one. So I define this phi alpha to be the characteristic function of zero alpha. And this means that this function is going to take the value uh, one if x is is between zero and alpha, and it takes the value of zero if x is uh, between alpha and one. Okay, and as you can see, that every phi alpha is in the area infinity, and uh, if you choose a different alpha, then this two, so the phi alpha minus the phi beta. The area infinity norm of these two will be equal to one if alpha is different from beta, right? So now we found this um, this collection of phi alphas, which are all in area infinity, and uh, the alpha is between zero and one. And apparently, this is the uncountable set because for every uh, because zero, the interval zero to one, this is uncountable. Uh, this is uncountable set. So this is an uncountable set right here. Okay, and you can see that the uh, uh, the distance between any two of this is equal to one. So there is no way to find a countable dense set of this set. Oh, sorry, of this. Right? There is no way to find a countable dense set of this. The reason is because if there exists a countable density of this, then we will encounter a similar issue as in here. And uh, uh, the, the phi alpha, phi the beta, they have a different distance uh, equal to one. So if you set your epsilon to be one half, then you can associate it with each of this phi alpha uh, with uh, one function in your countable dense set. And then that means the Cardinality of this set is less than or equal to the cardinality of that countable dense set, which is uh, countable, which is uh, LF zero.
but this one, this size here is uncountable. So that's where the contradiction is. Okay, so this implies that R infinity is not separable. Okay? And that technique is pretty similar to this one, the proof technique. Okay. Now let's consider an uh, example. And again, I'm going to not give you the, the proof. It's pretty uh, straightforward to prove. It's called the parallel, uh, parallelogram theorem, the parallelogram law, now which says that if you have f and g in L2, then you take the uh, the uh, square norm, square two norm of f plus g, and the square root two norm of f minus g is going to be equal to two times the square norm of f, and the square norm of g. Okay, and the proof is pretty simple. You just break the squares on the left, and then you cancel some things, and then you end up with the right hand side. Okay, so. Um, I'll give you a definition for uh, so generalize the Fourier series. You probably heard about the Fourier series. Um, that has a specific meaning. Uh, you transform a transform function, transform function into a new space called a Fourier space. And uh, to do that, you just uh, do this kind of kind of like uh, the convolutions. Uh, but that's not our purpose here. We're going to define the generalized which is a general theory about you know uh, making uh, basis orthonormal basis and uh, making uh, expansion of or writing some or express some function in terms of the basis. Let's consider that phi k is an orthonormal Orthonormal set. Okay, and then for any f in R two, we let this C k to be the inner product of f and phi k. For any k, then this. C case are called the generalized Fourier co coefficient of f. Under the under this orthonormal set, uh, and the this sum you use this C case as coefficient to to uh, write this linear composition of the basis or the orthonormal uh, functions. This is called the generalized Fourier series of f. Okay, we're going to so so just uh, to repeat, we have um, we say that this suppose this is the orthonormal set. Uh, we know the meaning perfectly so far. And then uh, for any function f, we can consider the selected projection of f onto this uh, each of these five k's, or take the inner product of f with each of these five k's, and then we get a scalar. And the c k's are called genera generalized free coefficients, and then you resemble the uh, this, and this is called a generalized Fourier series. Uh, but this is this one itself is not necessarily equal to f yet. Uh, because it depends on what this orthonormal basis is. Uh, since we said 
is that you can just pick a few or find many of these. Uh, you can form an orthonormal set, and using that, it's not necessarily giving you the uh, giving you back the original function. And even if you have countable many of them, say for example, in the previous example, like this one, uh, you have countable many of them. But if you extract a proper uh, countable subset of that, then apparently you are not going to get back to the original function f. Okay, and uh, in which case that we can get back to the f. Uh, it is only if this is, this orthonormal set is also complete, okay. But generally speaking, then we don't have that. We'll see that soon later. Um, what do you mean by completed orthonormal set? But so far, if we only have an orthonormal set, then this just gives us the notation for generalized Fourier equations and generalized Fourier series. Okay, uh, a general result for uh, the generalized Fourier series that. Say we have uh, for any fixed. Uh, suppose we start from a uh, orthonormal set, then for any fixed k, we can define the family f k to be all the uh, linear combinations of the phi k's phi's. Uh, first, uh, k phi i's, the sum of a i phi i, as from one to k. Just use the first uh, phi one through five k and uh, do uh, a linear span of them. We get this family of functions f k, and then what we can show is that such kind of function. Where this is the, like the uh, Fourier series, but now we only have finite basis, phi one through phi k, and this is the Fourier series, uh, where the c i is just the inner product product of f and phi i for some given function f. Then this function, so I should say in this way. Then for any f in L two, and uh, c i equals to the inner product of f and phi i, then such kind of function will be the unique minimizer of the uh, is the unique minimizer of the f minus g over the g's in this f k. Okay, so in other words, you can do this. So I'm trying to find a minimizer of f minus g, where g has to be from the fk. And the, the minimizer of this must be equal to this sum of ci phi i, i is from 1 to k. And then we call this the fk. Okay, so that just tells us that if we're trying to uh, minimize, uh, you try to try to kind of uh, doing a projection of your f of some f in uh, L2 space onto, onto this subspace of L2, then the unique minimizer or the, the projection point is actually like this. Okay? And there's only one projection point, which is this. Okay? So proof is pretty simple, actually. Uh, suppose we have Suppose we have a point from this family a subspace fk for any f in this, which we can we have to write it as the in the way of uh, linear span or linear uh, combination of the phi i's. We can see that. So basically, what it means that is this is like the fk. And uh, you have some other function, right? Say, for example, here, this is your f. Then what you can do is do a, do a orthogonal projection onto this fk. And this point right here has to be written as sum of ci phi i. Okay? 
And let's see that any function over here, over this uh, subspace, can be written in this way. Then let's just say that which one will be able to minimize the distance between f and uh, uh, minimize the distance to f. Okay, then we we'll consider that the distance between f and fk square. So this fk will be some point on this on subspace right here. Okay, then distance of this will be equal to according to uh, we just uh, break the square will be again this minus two times f fk plus the norm square norm of fk. And then you realize that this is the f. It's a given function f. The second term, because the fk is written in this linear span, so I can, uh, because of the linearity of inner products, I can do the inner product of f with each of these terms in the sum. And then we can even extract out the, the ci. So it will be sum of ci f phi i. And similarly, we can get this uh, sum of ci phi i, i from 1 to k squared. And then apparently this one is equal to ci. Okay, and so you actually have ci squared in here. And this, uh, sorry, it should be, uh, this inner part is, the, yeah, it should be ai because fk gives you the, sorry, fk is, I should say this, fk is written in this way, ai, so I have right here, it's ai, it's ai, All right, so now here this is the ai times ci, and here, you, you you can again break the square and they realize that uh, all these files are orthonormal. So that's that indicates that it's just the AI square f from one to k. Okay, and what we end up with is just f two norm square minus two times sum of AI CI as from one to k plus sum of i from one to k of AI square. And then we can add the sum of a ci square and then subtract it. What we are doing is just complete the square. It will be ai minus ci square i from 1 to k minus the sum uh, of ci square. That's from 1 to k. Okay, um, so that's the that's what happens when we are setting any arbitrary point f k in the in the sub in the subspace. The distance between that would be this. So in which case, in what choice of c i a i this will be minimized? And apparently, the a i on the right hand side only appear here. So the only way to minimize the right hand side is to choose the c i to be equal to this a i to be equal to the c i, right? So if we're going to minimize the right-hand side with respect to the AIs, then the only choice is to choose AI equal to CI. Okay. And this is because the F is already given. The CI is already a property associated with F. So there's nothing we can do with that. The only thing we can do is to change the, the FK, which is uh, to decide the choice of the AIs, but this is a minimized only if the AIs are equal to CI for any I from 1 to K. Okay, and this means that if we're going to minimize the distance here, we have to choose your FK to be the CI files. Okay.
So next, I'm going to show uh, um, somehow related to the, the completeness that I just mentioned. If you are just uh, given a, an orthonormal set, then you consider a generalized Fourier series uh, or generalized Fourier coefficients of the given function f, then uh, you will have the following inequality. you will have the following inequality, which is the sum of the ck squared is less than or equal to the 2 norm square of f, square 2 norm of f. Okay? And uh, generally, we only have this inequality. Uh, if this is a complete orthonormal set, as we showed earlier, uh, later, this will be equal equality. Okay, so generally, how do we prove this in uh, uh The proof is, say, we you just use the fact that we had earlier. Uh, we can set for any k, we can just set our f k to be the sum, the partial sum of the Fourier series. Then what we can do is. Uh, first of all, the distance between f and fk, this has to be greater than or equal to zero, right? It's norm, square norm. Uh, but on the other hand, we can show that just by the same uh, derivation earlier, we can break the square, and we will be able to show that this is just f to norm square minus fk to norm squared. Okay, we can show that uh, just uh, by looking at the, do the similar proof as above and setting as we said this fk to be to be this okay and then uh, it's also easy to show that the second term the fk square norm of a uh, square two norm of fk is just as the sum of ci i from one to k it's because the uh, phi i's are orthonormal so it's just this so uh, we see that the distance between these two is greater than zero so that means This is true, okay? And this is true for any k. So if you take the k, take the, uh, you tend the k to infinity, the, this is still true. Okay, so this is true for any k, and hence the infinite sum is also less than or equal to that. Okay, and this is called the base, uh, base L inequality. If you just have an orthonormal set, then this is the best you can get. Okay. Now let's look at a, a, a lemma that we're going to use to show the next theorem called the face uh, Ries Fisher theorem. So the lemma says, as the lemma is pretty simple here, it just says that if you have an orthonormal set, of L2 and the F is in L2 um, if you set your FK to be the partial uh, Fourier series as we did earlier then what we can do we can show is that the inner product of F uh, so fk and f minus fk is going to be zero. 
So basically what this means is that if you extract a partial Fourier series and you have some leftover, which is denoted by f minus fk, then this fk and the leftover, they are uh, orthogonal to each other. Okay, and that's uh, roughly you can think in this way. Uh, if you get this fk, which is this, and the, the leftover will be the distance between the two, and these two will be orthogonal to each other. So it's pretty like uh, in that sense. Okay, the proof is uh, straightforward again, and then we can see we'll take the inner product of f and fk. This is just equal to the sum according to the choice of fk. This is the sum of ci phi i's, right? i from 1 to k. So it's just a ci f phi i as from 1 to k. And this is equal to According to a choice, uh, according to the definition of ci, so this is just the, the sum of ci squared as from 1 to k. And then we know that this is just equal to the fk squared norm of fk, and that's also equal to the inner product of fk itself. So now we just uh, take the difference of the two sides, two sides will get that, we'll get this one. Okay, which is the take the difference. All right. Now here's the theorem. Ruiz Fisher. So what it says is, suppose we have, again we have an orthonormal set. Suppose that we have a, a sequence of numbers, or we have this series, CK, K from 1 to infinity, that is convergent. Then we will be able to find some function G in L2, such that the uh, inner product of G with phi K will be exactly equal to CK for each K. And actually, you can easily show later that this g is nothing but just the sum of ck phi k, which is associated with each phi k, the number ck. And then this g will be the one you need. Okay? Okay. Let's see how to prove this. All right, to prove this, uh, we first want to show that such a G exists, and then we later show that this G has this property right here. Okay, so how do we first show it exists? So let's first show that, let's first denote this partial uh, sum, which is the Ci phi i, from 1 to k. And apparently this is in L2, because each phi i is in L2, and you just have a finite combination of them, and the ci is all finite numbers, so this is in L2, apparently. And then uh, we can look at the distance between k plus l. l is any other integer of a natural number, and take the difference between the two. And apparently this is going to give us the uh, uh, the other terms are ci phi i and i is from k plus one to k plus l squared, right? And this is apparently is equal to the sum of the ci squared, where same i from k plus one to k plus l. And we know that when k goes to infinity, this should be going to zero. The reason is that this series is actually convergent. So that's, uh, this is like the, uh, the difference of these two. And this shows that if this goes to zero as k goes to infinity, without, uh, regardless of L, that means this S is a Cauchy sequence in L2. Right, so the SK is Cauchy in L2. And because L2 is complete, we know that this 
uh, they must convert to some point in L2 or some function in L2. Or to G, G in R2. And what this means is that the two norm, uh, or square two norm, between uh, of the distance between, or the difference between SK and G is converted to zero as K goes to infinity. So this is what it means by conversion in the in R2 space, right? Because we use this as the distance or metric in the R2 space. Okay, so now we at least show that there exists such a G, and what it, what is left, uh, what is remaining uh, remains to be shown is uh, is this. We need to show that uh, if this S K convert to that G, then that G actually satisfies this for every K. Okay, and how do we do that? Well, uh, let's say. Because G is in L2, uh, we know the inner product of G and the phi, K, they should be a finite number. Remember that if two of them are finite, the inner product must be bounded by the product of their two norms. So this must be a finite number. So let's call this uh, AI, AK. AK equals that. We will define AK to be that, and that is going to be finite. And then let say let the GK. So we have the AKs. Let's uh, assemble, uh, make a linear combination of this, the five I's using this AK. Right now, I don't, I don't care what uh, the SK was. I just know that there's such a G here, and I'm going to get a partial Fourier series of this, uh, of this G. And I'm going to show that this partial Fourier series GK here is just identical to the SK there. Okay, and the, from here, we will be able to show that the inner product of G and the each phi K will be just the, the, uh, uh, the CK. So now let's change. How do we show that this GK is actually identical to the uh, SK? Um, well, we first look at the distance between GK and SK. And apparently, this is the less than equal to mm, Okay, so we're adding some non-negative non numbers, so it has to be less than that. All right, and then um, now the question is, how do we move from here? We have these two terms. Uh, basically, this is living in this FK space, because FK, remember, is a, it's a linear subspace. Uh, I forgot where it was. Here, this. So basically, this is in that, in that subspace FK. And this is, we know there's something that is like perpendicular to the space. We take out the projection point GK. Okay, and uh, these two should be, they take the inner part of these two, it should be zero. So let's see if that's true, and then we can move from here, from there. Okay, so let's take the inner product of this F, SK minus GK and G minus GK. Well, so they can be separated to SK, G minus GK, minus uh, GK, G minus GK. Well, using the lemma before, uh, remember here that uh, if you have this uh, partial Fourier, generalized Fourier series of a function, then uh, we will be able to find this. 
we'll be able to get that. And this implies that this should be equal to zero. Okay, this is by the lemma. So we only end up with this first term. And uh, this is just uh, SK G minus SK GK. But this is uh, what this one is. The SK is the sum it's kind of things like this. The SK is this. GK is this. So we just plug them in. We'll be able to show that this is just the sum of the CI phi I uh, G as from 1 to K minus the sum of the again the CI phi I and the GK for I from 1 to K. And remember that this first term is giving us CI and AI because we know the projection of G to each of these phi is the AI. And now the second term it will be CI and you have the phi I GK. But the phi GK is just a phi I sum of AI phi I is from 1 to K. Well, apparently we will take the inner product because the, these phi's are orthonormal, so we only have one term left. That would be just a phi itself, or if you like, you can have just a phi j, or aj, j from 1 to k. And there was only one term left, which is the ai times the phi i norm squared, which is just the ai itself. So this is also equal to ai. And uh, these two will be canceled, and they will have this equal to zero. So that means these two are actually orthogonal to each other. And that's why when we have two orthogonal ones, if this is equal to zero, then the A uh, norm squared plus B norm squared is equal to A minus B squared. Okay? Right? Because the this is uh, equal to zero. Okay, so break the square, you just have this two plus the inner two times inner product, but that, that is zero. Okay, and the big of this, we can continue from there. Uh, this inner, this uh, right hand side here should be equal to the uh, SK minus GK plus G minus GK or minus G minus GK squared and this is equal to SK minus G squared okay now uh, remember that SK converts to G so this norm is going to zero so this goes to zero as K goes to infinity right uh, but on the other hand I know that this is uh, this left hand side is this the sum of SK GK they are both finite span of the phi i's so it's one is like that one is like this so you can easily show that this left hand side will be equal to and let me just write it a little bit low uh, can show that the SK minus GK two norm squared is equal to SK minus G two norm squared. So I know that this right hand side goes to zero, but on the left hand side, this will be equal to the sum of, so you just see the inside, this is just the sum of AI or CI minus AI. Doesn't matter. Phi I from 1 to k. So these phi's are also normal. So you put the square norm of this sum that's just uh, equal to the sum of the coefficients, which is say AI, say I minus AI squared. I is from 1 to k. Okay, and as k goes to infinity, this this is the increasing sequence, non-negative increasing sequence as k goes to uh, increases. And as it goes to infinity, this one actually goes to zero. And what we can claim from here is that 
just means that AI equals that each term, uh, every term must be zero. Okay, so the AI must be equal to CI for any i, and this implies that the GK is actually equal to the SK, and that the SK is this one, and that this SK will actually be the uh, uh, partial Fourier uh, series. Okay. In the in this case, you can see if this SK uh, is nothing but just the GK itself, then you take the inner you take the uh, so the CI also will be just the AI. So the, the this one, which we assume that is AI, now it turns out to be just the CI. Oh, sorry, AK. It turns out to, just, to be just the CK. Okay, and that's complete proof. OK. Now come to, it comes to the definition of complete orthonormal basis. That will be. Uh, the way uh, the ideal case that we have a, a countable orthonormal set, but the, the also, there are sufficient to represent uh, any function in the uh, in R two. Okay, we call the uh, this orthonormal set a complete orthonormal basis if uh, itself is orthonormal set, and for any function f, uh, for a function f, sorry, for any function f that satisfies. If, For any function f, you take the inner product of this f or projection of f into, onto the f k gets zero. For any k, implies this f must be equal to zero almost everywhere. Okay, so it's a complete orthonormal basis if itself is orthonormal set. And for any function f, uh, you get this equal to zero for any k. Then this f is equal to zero. In this case, we call if this basis or this orthonormal set satisfies this property. We call it a complete orthonormal basis. Okay. So uh, now we kind of have a better properties of uh, the orthonormal basis uh, because suppose we have the five case that are complete. So suppose it's a complete uh, orthonormal basis. Suppose we have a function f in R2, and the ck will be equal to the uh, projection of f to 5k. For all the case, then we can show that the limit as k goes to infinity, the limit of this partial Fourier series is going to converge to f. Okay, so this is not true for general orthonormal set. If the orthonormal set is not complete, we won't be able to find this. And from here, we actually can show the uh, Bessel equality, uh, which means the sum of the CI square 
infinite sum of the series of ci squared is equal to the square two norm of f. Okay, so let's see how to prove this. Uh, now what we have so far is that we know this is orthonormal, it's a complete orthonormal basis, which means that if we, we have some function f, we do the projection of fact k, it's always zero, then that means the function itself is just a zero almost everywhere. Okay? Basically a zero function. Um, and now let's say that we have this f, which is written in this way. And then how do we show that this is this limit is equal to zero? Well, first thing that we can show is um, because the Bessel inequality which is the one we showed earlier we know the sum of the ci squared or should I say the k k from 1 to infinity ck this is just uh, less than or equal to the square 2 norm of f but f is in r2 so that means it's finite and it's finite means that the series is convergent okay so i know that such kind of ca and it forms a series, square of them uh, as a forms a series, and this series is convergent. Okay, that's one thing we know. The other thing is that because they have this finite, and by the uh, Ries Fisher theorem ab above, we know that there exists some g function g such that when you write out uh, uh, the g is in R2, and the g it will be a, a general generalize the Fourier series using the CKS coefficients. So by the uh, Ries feature, there exists G, which is equal to the sum of CK um, phi K and that is in R2 as well. Okay, so now we're going to show that this f and this g are actually the same, and that's always, that will be able to will be able to imply this uh, this limit. So how do we do that? Well, here let's go. Let's just uh, consider the difference of these two and f i k. And apparently, this is going to give us by the linearity of inner, uh, inner products, this is going to be give us this minus g phi k. So on the one hand, we know that this one is, the, the first term is going to give us the ck according to definition. The second term is also the ck because we define our g to be, uh, to be this, to be this. And actually, this is also from the proof of the Ries-Fisher theorem. We take the inner product of the g and the phi k. That's going to give us ck. So this is also ck, and that gives us zero finite k. And now, because the phi k forms a complete uh, orthonormal basis, and the f minus g times the phi k is equal to zero for every k, that means f minus g is just equal to zero almost everywhere, since this phi k. Is also is a complete auto normal basis, okay? And uh, in the proof of the Ries theorem, uh, Ries Fisher theorem above, we have shown that when we define the S K to be the partial sum, the partial series. We show that it's converged to G in the R2 space. And uh, that also means that this SK minus G, two norm, is going to zero. Okay, it's converging to zero. But right now, since F and G are equal almost everywhere, so this G can be just replaced by F. And that shows that SK minus F goes to zero. Okay, and that's actually the 
the claim we're making here. Okay. So now let's introduce a um, related to the concept called linear linear independency. So, it's, uh, so you can see we have uh, orthonormal basis, um, or we if we want to construct uh, orthonormal basis, we can start from a set of linear independent functions, and then uh, we can do a kind of uh, orthono orthogonalization of those uh, functions to get the basis. Okay, so let's say that the, the sequence of functions we call phi is called linearly independent. If um, any linear combination of them being zero implies that uh, the coefficients must be zero. If this implies all the CIs needs to be zero. Okay. And uh, if we have a infinite set, so the K uh, is any natural number, and then we call this linearly independent. If any finite sum, a finite set of this family is a linearly independent, okay. So this is a, a generalization of the linear independency into the infinite, infinite, infinite in dimensional space. Uh, previously, when we consider vector spaces, uh, those spaces are finite dimensional. So we we consider the basis or linear independent sets. There could be only finite many of them. But uh, uh, in R two, this is the infinite dimensional space. So uh, in this case, we will be able to we could get uh, a set of uh, or a phonomal set, which is a which is linear independent, and this set is infinite. This is a um, a generalization of linear independency. Okay. Um, for example, we can say um, if you have a orthonormal base. So, for example, if you have an orthonormal set, and then apparently this orthonormal set, if this is an orthonormal set, then apparently they will be linear independent, right? Because the, each one is. Uh, you look at any one, say, if this is a, it's an also normal basis, or also normal set, it doesn't have to be complete even, then this must be linearly dependent. The reason is, you can imagine that um, if I extract a finite subset of this uh, orthonormal set, then what we'll get is like the, uh, say, the phi k i's, i's from 1 to, say, n. Uh, yeah, if I make a linear combination of this, let me rewrite in here. Let's make a linear combination of this. Then I can claim that this equal to zero implies all the coefficients equal to zero. The reason is that if this is equal to zero, then I can multiply the ki on both sides. Then what I will get is just the ci phi k i square norm equals zero. So this will imply that just by multiplying the phi ki on both sides. But this is the orthonormal set, so this means that this is equal to one, and this implies the ci equals to zero. And apparently, that if this is true for every i, then it has to be a linear independent set. So this is a, this set itself is infinite, but we can still talk about in linear independency of this, right? And the simple uh, 
method to uh, make a linear independent set orthogonal orthonormal is to say we have a set of a set of functions that are linear independent. Suppose if k is a, where k is a natural number, it's a linearly independent. Then we can just apply the um, Gram-Schmidt procedure or Gram-Schmidt process. This will generate a uh, also normal set. And how do we do that? Uh, you probably all seen this before. I'm going to construct the first of phi one just to pick up the psi one. I'm going to construct the first of phi one to be the psi one divided by the norm of uh, percent one. I remember that all this, if they are linearly independent, then the none of them can be zero. Because if any one of them is zero, then you definitely can put some non zero number to it, and that this will be still zero. And that uh, violates the definition of linear independence. So all those phi functions must be non zero. And making a linear combination of those things, if you got zero, that just means that all the constants are, coefficients are equal to zero. And this is something that we're going to use to, to show that the Gram Schmidt. Uh, procedure will never end uh, until you uh, exhausted exhausted this uh, Poseidon case. Okay, so this is all going to be our first uh, phi one, and the phi two will first uh, uh, normalize or do the projection of the of Poseidon two to this phi one, and then uh, we'll just uh, divide the norm. Okay, so normalize it. And this will uh, take out the part that is uh, uh, on the line or along the uh, phi one direction. And you get a phi two. Okay, and this must be non-zero because this, uh, if this is equal to zero, sorry, this will be phi one. If the numerator, if the numerator is zero. If this one is zero, then just means uh, that we can find a uh, linear combination of uh, because actually you can see this this each phi is just a linear combination of the previous phi. So the phi one is a linear combination of psi one, phi two is a linear combination of phi psi two and uh, phi one. But phi one is a li linear combination of the previous the psi one. So Essentially, a linear product, linear combination of the psi, psi one, psi two, and if this is equal to zero, it just means all the coefficients are equal to zero. But that's not uh, uh, that's not possible because at least here this is not zero, right? So the now of this will be zero. That's why you can divide. You can put the norm of the denominator, which will be uh, non-zero there. Okay, and just continue doing this, and you will generate um, a sequence. So the psi k will be just the uh, uh, phi k will be just the psi k minus the sum of the uh, psi k to each of the bases you obtained so far. And divided by the same thing, the norm. Just the same numerator and put it here, norm. And that's the gram schmidt procedure. Okay, and finally, uh, we do give a theorem. Uh, suppose uh, we have this uh, orthonormal set. Yeah, L square, L two. If for any 
F and uh, epsilon greater than zero. There you can see it's a uh, finite subset of the Poseidon, which we call denoted by Psi i j, where j is 1 through k. Okay, this is a finite subset of the of the family here, or the orthonormal set here, and uh, such that the distance between f and uh, the c i by uh, i j. Which is from one to k. This is less epsilon. Then the orthogonal orthogonal set here is complete. Okay, um, so the state theorem says like this. Suppose we have a orthonormal set. Okay, this is the orthonormal set of uh, of functions. If for any f in R two and any epsilon, we can find a finite subset of this uh, of i's, or we denote this by this. There's a finite subset of that, and uh, there also exists, or there also exists the cj's, also you have cj's, which are just uh, numbers. Okay, just numbers such that the uh, distance between f and the linear combination of this phi i j is less than epsilon, then this phi is called complete. Uh, this phi is actually complete. It's a complete orthonormal basis. All right, to prove that, let's do this by uh, contradiction. Assume phi is not complete. If it's not complete, According to the definition of complete basis, a complete orthonormal basis, we know that there exists a function f non-zero uh, non-zero means that it's not a zero almost everywhere, such that the uh, phi uh, the f and the phi i is equal to zero for any i. Yeah, yeah. Okay, this will be true. And let's see how do we get a contradiction out of it. All right, because f is non-zero, that means the two norm of f will be positive, right? So uh, let's say that I'm going to choose this epsilon to be half of this. So let epsilon to be half of the two norm of f. Then there exists some. Uh, subset, final subset of the phi's, which is called the phi i j, and also the c j. So the j is from 1 to k. It's finite many of them, such that the distance between f and the phi i c i phi i c j phi i j phi j. j is from 1 to k. The distance between this will be less than epsilon, which is uh, will be set to uh, normal of f divided by 2. Now, uh, on the one hand, we know when we take the inner product of f and the f minus that that the combination let's see what happens uh, apparently the norm of this 
I'm sorry, the, the absolute value of this will be less than or equal to according to or um, to the uh, the property of the inner product. The inner product of the two functions will be less than or equal to the, the two norm, the product of the two norms. So it will be less than or equal to this. Will be less than this, but uh, this term is less than or equal to this as we showed here. So it would be less than or equal to half of square root of two norm of f because we have two of these uh, two normals of f. Okay, so that's on the one hand we have this. On the other hand, we again look at this inner product. And we will see that, uh, let's break the second term using the linear linearity of this uh, inner product, so it will be just this. Okay, and apparently this second term right here will be equal to zero, because if you move this C, uh, sum and the CJ out, the f is perpendicular to each of this phi, each of the one, uh, functions in the in the orthonormal set, so it will be orthogonal to each of these sub elements in the subset. So this will be a complete zero, and what we end up with is that this is just the, the square root norm. So on the one hand, we know that this quantity is equal to, or this quantity is has a value uh, bounded by that, but on the other hand, we show that this quantity is equal to that. And apparently these two do match, and that's where the contradiction is. And this implies that our assumption at the beginning is not correct, and that means uh, the phi must be a complete orthonormal basis.